Hey Booktube! So today's video is going to be another book review, and the book I'm going to be talking about is Wicked Saints by Emily A. Duncan. So yeah, I kind of ended up with two copies of this book, so I'll maybe keep this one here while I probably just wave this one about for a little bit. So if you've been living under a rock for the past couple months, or in fact in a backwater Kalyazi monastery, um, you, you may have missed the news uh, about this book. <laughs> this book was seriously hyped up before it came out, it had like a fantastic like PR thing going on, um, it, it was kind of impossible to not know that this book was coming out so if you don't know anything about it then I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown of the plot to catch you up I guess. So Wicked Saints is a Slavic inspired YA fantasy with dark magic and a heavy romance plot. Uh, this I believe is Emily A. Duncan's first published novel and I also believe it's the first in a planned series. So this is a book that follows three main characters over two perspectives. So first is Nadia who is a POV character. She is a young girl who can speak to the gods and then they allow her to wield their magic. There is also, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, I think it's Malakiash, who is a powerful kind of blood mage known as a vulture, and he has defected from the enemy's army, and we see him through Nadia's POV. And the last main character, who is the second POV, is Seraphin, and he is a blood mage and also the prince of the enemy country. The basic setup for this story is that Nadia is living in a country that worships the gods and this country is under siege from the neighbouring country. The invading country practices heretical blood magic and has rejected the idea of worshipping the gods and so the two countries have been like in all out war for quite some time. The monastery where Nadia has been in training all her life is attacked by the prince and his forces and so she is forced to flee. She ends up encountering Malakiash and like his companions while she's on the run and even though they should be enemies, necessity forces them to team up. So that's basically like just the non-spoilery overview of the plot of this book. So I read this book for Medievalathon this month and it took me I think about like two days to read through the whole thing. So like it, it is a pretty short story. Unfortunately, I only gave this book 3 out of 5 stars. For me, 3 stars means that I liked the book, um, but like it, it wasn't anything special, and like though it was entertaining, it's not great. Just like baseline average, more or less. So if you haven't yet read this book, um, I guess like my non-spoilery thoughts on this are that I guess I felt like the characters were very one note. Um, the main character, Nadia, um, I felt like she had almost no agency, she was very bland. Um, the plot is therefore kind of weak, um, there's way way too much emphasis on the romance which is essentially like an insta-love kind of situation, and it's way too similar to another series and I feel like most people probably know that by now. <laughs> also, can we just talk about one thing, like, is the girl on the spine of the book is it meant to be Nadia or is it meant to be the author? I thought maybe this is supposed to be Nadia but then like I thought Nadia was supposed to be like way younger than that, so yeah, so if you haven't read this book and you don't want spoilers, from here on out I will be going into my very spoilery kind of review. Um, I'm not going to be like going through like the whole plot of the book, but I'm going to be talking about various points that will probably only make sense if you've read the book in context, um, and then other things will just be like just straight up spoilers for things that happen in this book, so you've been warned. <sighs> so. I felt really let down by this novel. The synopsis um, of this book, as well as all of the hype around it before it came out, um, really promised something that was not delivered. It's not to say that the book is bad, it's just that building up to be something that it really wasn't um, sort of caused me a lot of disappointment, I guess. Um, starting out with the obvious thing, uh, while I was reading this I found this to be so so similar to Lee Bardugo's Grisha series. I know this has probably been talked about a lot and pretty much everyone I think kind of knows that about this book by now. Um, aside from the setting, because you can obviously have more than one YA fantasy that has been inspired by like Eastern European countries and culture, um, but it just had too much in common. You have your white-haired female protagonist, and like I know Alina wasn't white-haired to begin with, but like by the end she was like the white-haired female protagonist, um, who is basically like the chosen one. In the Grisha books the main character Alina is like thought of as a saint with like this god-given power, whereas in this, in Wicked Saints, Nadia is actually a saint and her power is supposedly god-given. Like, Malakiash is basically the Darkling 2.0, um, except if you like scaled back that cold calculating nature of the Darkling and just like kind of like replaced it with basically just like a basic emo boy who has like no personality beyond the like dark circles under his eyes. 
And then obviously you have the sort of snarky prince character. Initially, I wasn't really too bothered by all the similarities since like a lot of YA tend to follow like the same set pieces. But after watching like a few of the reviews and looking up some stuff about this book, um, yeah, it turns out that Emily A. Duncan was previously or maybe still is like a fairly well-known person in like the Grisha fan community and she's apparently like a very avid Darkling Alina shipper and that this is well known um, and I can like 100% see that in this book. <laughs> Uh, knowing that, I'm pretty sure that this author just wanted to write basically that exact thing, like more or less just one step up from being a basic fanfic. Um, but Lee Bardugo, uh, as far as I know, has had nothing but positive things to say about this book, so like, if she's not bothered about this being more or less a spin-off of her earlier work, then like, I'm not gonna hold too many grudges. Um, but yeah, I think it just needs to be pointed out, for sure. <sighs> so, uh, <laughs> shall we talk about the characters in this book? Let me show you basically every character in this book. Yep, they're all really white. <laughs> Aside from some very forgettable and entirely removable side characters that have absolutely no impact or bearing on the story whatsoever, um, basically everyone in this book is like super white. And I think that kind of the fact that only the side characters are kind of diverse is kind of a bit too obvious, especially since they have absolutely basically no impact on anything at all. And it kind of feels like maybe they were just added in as like an afterthought. I'm not really gonna get too much into that, but like, it was noticeable. <laughs> I think my main gripe with the book is just how little agency the protagonist has and just how like paper thin the story really is. Nadia makes almost no decisions in the whole book. She doesn't choose to leave the monastery, she doesn't really get to choose where they go or what they do, she just agrees to things, and she doesn't really seem to actually have like her own goal. She just has zero personality. It's really unfortunate when a POV character has basically no voice, and what I mean by that is that there was like nothing really in the text or her thoughts or her actions that really stood out or like made her her. She was just very bland, very basic, cookie cutter e like YA female main character. She's more or less just like a placeholder for any girl that wants to see herself in the like romance with Mal, which by the way, naming like your Darkling 2.0 character basically after the guy that Alina actually got with in the Grisha series. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Nadia's entire thought process is just entirely inconsistent. She's supposedly been trained like her whole life to fight and to use her god-given magic, and which by the way, like we're not actually really told what the training is, it's just training, um, generic training, so like is it training in magic? Is it training in like combat? Or is it is it just that she's just learning about the gods? Like honestly, Maybe some background information that isn't about her, like, strict regime of potato peeling would have been more effective. <laughs> Supposedly she's been trained to, like, use her magic, which, by the way, because she's obviously got access to all of the gods' blessings, would surely make her, like, the most powerful saint to have ever lived in history. But she's basically useless. Like, the first chapter is her knowing she should run away, refusing to escape and then going out to fight basically at the front of a battle because something in her head must have told her that she's been prepared for this, that she has the skill for this so at this point it's like okay so she is a skilled magical warrior or magic user of some sort but then the minute the fighting starts <laughs> She's basically just standing around until the enemy break in. And then once they do, then she's like, oh yeah, I should probably run away. Because basically the minute they break in, she knows that she can't actually fight them. Which begs the question, okay, so if she's been training for her whole life and she can't actually fight, then why did she go out to the front? Why didn't she just run away? But, but if she didn't, like, it's just, it's so inconsistent. It's like, is she skilled or is she not skilled? Does she want to run or does she not want to run? Can she fight them or can't she fight them? And no matter which like way you put it, whether she's skilled and wanted to fight and ended up running or whether she's not, it's just like no matter which way you put it, she's a dumbass. Because if she just run in the first place, then she would have escaped much sooner and got like a head start. Where if she could actually fight, then she would have maybe actually fought them instead of just sort of standing around and then running away. So whether she's good at fighting or not doesn't really make a difference. 
She's still a dumbass who didn't do anything, she just kind of stood there for the whole first chapter of the book and that was it. <laughs> it's just like, if she's been training her whole life, why can't she fight them? I mean, we, I understand that Seraphin is a powerful blood mage, but at the same time, like, what did she expect? Did, did she expect to not be fighting people that are also powerful? There was also just that very cringy moment at the start of the book where it was like, oh, they're definitely not going to be attacking. What? It's definitely not going to be like the prince walking up and knocking on the front door. Don't be stupid. And then like, it is. And it just felt so, oh, so cringe. But yeah, that aside, Nadia's entire personality is basically just like, gods are good, Trinavians are bad. Is that what they're called? Trinavians or Trevanians? Let me look this up. Yeah, Trinavia. Her gods want her to kill basically any Trinavian she meets, and she's like 100% on board with this, especially because they've been essentially assaulting her entire country for like her entire life, and I think like many, many decades. And they've just destroyed the monastery and likely just killed all of her friends. So you think she would be pretty anti Trinavian, except the very first guy that she meets who is Trinavian and also a blood mage, and like the worst kind of blood mage, because he's also a vulture, which is like the worst, most twisted, monstrous, heretical kind of blood mage that there is. She's just suddenly okay with just chilling in the snow with this dude. She basically like flip-flops between not having any issue with this guy, and then like a bit of inner monologue about how she should want him dead, but she doesn't. Which kind of begs the question of, if she's not anti trinavian at all, because like, it, it can't get any worse than this guy. So if she's not anti Trinavian at all, then why is that supposedly part of her personality? Because it seems to be the only, like, driving factor about her, but yet it's also not real and not really present and has no effect on the story and has really sort of like no implications or impact on anything that happens. <laughs> so why is it there? Why is she the main character if she in fact doesn't hate Trinavians at all, even though she says she does, but it's not reflected in any of her actions basically at any point. Actually, I think ever. And it's like, why doesn't she hate him? Is it literally just because he has like a sad emo boy haircut and a hangnail? He represents everything that she should hate and supposedly does hate, and yet she has seemingly no issue whatsoever getting over a whole lifetime's worth of prejudice. It's like there are some like faux difficulties and some like half-hearted protests and like things going on but like that's about it and again they don't come up they don't have a lasting impact and they're just kind of it's just kind of her going oh but i really shouldn't like trinavians and that's it that is like the extent of her hatred towards them i guess that that's it that's the extent of her inner conflict is her just kind of being hmm maybe i shouldn't like them you think it's the same for when she meets Seraphin. He is a blood mage, he is a prince and the heir to the throne of the country which is essentially being trying to destroy her home and throw out her entire system of belief for like as long as she can remember. And he is the man who personally tore through her monastery and murdered her friends. She goes to like one dinner with him and she's like, oh yeah I guess he's cool now. Like there are no repercussions for any of his actions earlier in the book. She just gets over it like super quick. I don't think she even like really even mentions or thinks about the friends that he may or may not have killed basically once she starts being buddies with him. Like it, it just does not come up. There's just no conflict and at the end of the day she's just kind of stupid. She has no opinions that aren't immediately reversible, no goals that can't just be immediately replaced with someone else's, and absolutely no personality or individuality whatsoever. Like, I can see exactly why the gods picked her as their conduit because she is the emptiest vessel of a character I have come across in a long time and has basically no willpower or agency of her own whatsoever. I feel like a lot of the characters also just read really young to me. Like, I kept... Like, my gut feeling was that Nadia was, like, either 14 or 15, just because of how she behaved, how she reacted to situations. Um, I think she was meant to be, like, 17, question mark? I don't remember, but she she didn't come off that way. Um, she just seemed very, like, juvenile, pretty infantile. Malakiash isn't really much better. I did like his character at the beginning. I thought we could get some interesting things out of a boy turned into a monster who chose to defect. Like, whether or not he's actually at that point going to be revealed to be evil at the end or not. Like, whether he's good or not, I feel like actually at least exploring that 
would have been interesting. Uh, unfortunately, Mal is just as one note as Nadia though, except that like, because he's trying to be like the Darkling, you know, he has at least like the tiniest hint of a personality. It's like, I, I liked the little bits that we got, like I liked that he wrote his spells himself, I liked that the book wanted to keep you trying to question whether or not he was good or evil, like whether it was all a lie. I like, I liked that at the end, he basically just peaced out and went to be evil somewhere. Um, but for the most part, I, I just feel like it was like major wasted potential. Um, most of his place in the book, aside from being like the one thing that just sort of like pushed everyone else and like told them what the next part of the plot was gonna be, um, was essentially just to sort of be the like dark broody love interest. I don't know how to say but like literally his entire method of seduction is just doing this. That's it. That wasn't really worth the joke of doing it, I just had to rearrange my whole thing again. So much of this book is just Nadia saying like the same thing over and over again, basically some variation of like, he's attractive, but I shouldn't like him. But he's just a boy, but he's also a monster. But he's also attractive, but I definitely do not like him. But also he is cute. <sighs> After they've actually got together, this gets sprinkled in with generous mentions of basically the same phrase of like, her heart was shattered into a thousand pieces and just broken, just, just so unbelievably just shattered into a thousand pieces. Like, like several times. Like several times in fairly quick succession. Like, a very small number of pages between each time that this occurred. And honestly, for very little reason, for the most part. I feel like Malaki Ash would have been so much more interesting as a POV character, and like, I know the only reason that she didn't do that was obviously because he is evil at the end, and it's like, well, it might have been a giveaway unless he'd been an unreliable narrator, but they tend to be harder for people to write, especially when you're writing, like, this kind of YA. So, yeah, I, I feel like he suffered because we've only got, like, Nadia's bland perspective on him. Finally, you have Seraphin, who actually by the end of the book was actually my favourite character. I will admit, the entire ending was just an absolute clusterfuck of, like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, the thing with, like, the moths and the stars was, like, okay? But aside from, like, the major deus ex machina, like, literally, what the hell was even going on? This came out of nowhere, like it wasn't really to do with any character's actions, no one had... It, it was just there, it was just like a thing that happened. And it, it did just feel kind of weird, it did feel jarring like to the point where it kind of took me out of the text and I was just kind of like... Because like reading it, it, it did feel pretty random. I know from like a aesthetics point of view it's like, oh yeah, stars and moths and I'm like, I get it, like these are all like just popular things in like YA symbolism. So like, I, I get it from like a, oh this must look cool, but at the same time it's kind of like, it just felt like it came out of nowhere. And Seraphim does also make some like, real dumb decisions. Like, I know, like he says he's playing along like more or less exactly as his father would want him to so that he can like, see what's going on. But also, if he had in fact never suspected anything, then he would have taken the exact same path as he did. So like, it, it literally made no difference. <laughs> Whether he was aware of it at the beginning or not, it made no difference to his actions. So what was the point? I do like his interactions with the two friends that he has that guard him. Like, there were a few fun lines of banter and I actually kind of like the dynamic between them. Like, I like their friendship aspect much more because unlike some other characters, it actually seemed to make sense the way that they know each other and interact and it was just more believable. For some reason, actually, when I first read it, <laughs> I for some reason just assumed that Seraphin and Casper would just be like a thing. Like I have no idea why I thought that or what prompted that but like I just kind of expected it to be a thing until like at least like halfway through the book. Seraphin's story seemed to flow a bit more naturally as well since like Nadia's POV was full of like starts and introductions and like this character, this character, this character and then like this setup, this setup, blah blah blah. Whereas Seraphin's just felt a bit more, like his plotline didn't really suffer from that so even though it was like for the most part less eventful it did just feel more cohesive. Like the story does do some things well, like I'm not truly trying to hate on the book, it does do some things well, like I like the general setup and like I like the question of like oh are the gods real? Are they just like really powerful mages who like ascended in some way and like they're not what we thought they were? But maybe that's because I like Dragon Age and the biggest question posed by the video games at the moment is like, ooh, are all the gods in fact just really powerful mages and not what we thought they were? And it turns out that Emily A. Duncan also really likes Dragon Age, so yeah. <laughs> I feel like this book had so much potential and like whoever was doing the marketing um, clearly did very well. 
because yeah this book did not deserve all the hype that it got like not by a mile also like the quote the quote on the front of the book is just laughable let them fear her fear what like she doesn't do anything there's nothing to fear and like who who is the them who is the they who is the them is it Trinavia? Because she literally makes friends with the two people in the world she should have hated the most, the prince and a vulture. So like, why is that the tagline? Nobody has reason to fear Nadia. She doesn't ever do anything to make anyone afraid. She's never aggressive, like, she didn't even want to kill, like, that one Trinavian blood mage girl who, like, actively challenged her to a fight to the death. Like, a mortal enemy actually actively trying to kill her in a fight to the death and she still did not want to kill that girl she still wanted to spare her life it still wasn't even enough for her to want to fight back so like actually how can she hate Trinavians like why would anybody fear her when you can actually try to kill her in a combat specifically designed for only one person to leave that ring like she just met this girl she hated this girl and the way that she spoke to her and they like argued and talked back. She got challenged to a fight to the death and still didn't want to kill this girl even though her entire thing is that she should probably want to kill all Trinavians and like her gods were telling her to do it. So like, you could literally do anything to Nadia and she would just clearly never retaliate in any way ever because how much more do you have to do? It doesn't matter if you're a vulture, it doesn't matter if you challenge her to a fight to the death and it doesn't matter if you're the prince of the enemy country who like destroyed her home and slaughtered her friends. It makes no difference to her. She doesn't care. She has no agency. She has no opinions or willpower of her own. She does not care what happens in her own story. I'm getting so mad. Why would you fear her? She does nothing. She doesn't do anything. She doesn't have any wills or desires or anything. I just, I, I literally don't get, I, I don't get why she would just, just, it's just, I just don't understand why you would tell us a character is all of these things and then not make them any of those things, even within like the same page. Like you can't say that somebody has this driving force and has this personality and has these opinions and then only ever show us the opposite. And it would work if you had like an unreliable narrator or something, but it doesn't work. It does not work like this. It's so bad, it's like if you wanted to write a girl who was forgiving and who didn't hate all of the Trinavians even because of what they'd done to her and even because her gods say that, then write that book. But don't make her act that way and then tell us that she's the complete opposite. Because it's just not true. It can't be both. <laughs> it's just like, at the end of the day, literally what could possibly entice her to incite fear into somebody else? Just like at all. Just like ever. I thought this book was going to be so different. I thought that like because of the description I thought it would have three POVs and like I thought it would be so much darker and like maybe like longer. And I thought that all three POVs would like convene at some point and like just coalesce into like one long cohesive story like just all these three separate parts finally merging together because that's a real satisfying thing when it happens in a story. Like three unrelated narratives that like slowly start to merge together and then like meet at some point like could we not have had that <laughs> i thought that nadia would be like determined and driven and merciless and vengeful and she wasn't any of those things i thought she would actually use her powers against the people that wronged her and i definitely thought that if there was going to be a romance aside from being angsty like that it would be hard won like full of doubt and conflict that was actually substantial and you don't really get a lot of the like in-between parts of the story, you don't get how they get from one place to another, it's just major plot point, major plot point, major plot point, so like, I imagine maybe they like talked and their friendships deepened or whatever on that like hike through the snow, I guess, maybe it took several days, maybe it took several weeks, I don't remember. I don't get to see any of that. So when they suddenly just like care about each other, I forget the girl's name, is she called like Path or something, I think? Um, like, they care about what happens to each other and it's like, but like from my perspective, you've more or less just met and I haven't really seen much interaction between you, aside from like some fight sequences. 
So it hasn't really been the best for like characterizing those individuals and like giving me some sort of semblance of like their relationships like the dynamics between the players in the story and it just hmm I feel like and it's not a thing about authors who write fanfiction because like I like fanfiction I write fanfiction I write a different kind of fanfiction to this I would say um I don't really do shipping as a thing it's just not for me um but i feel like a big thing with fan fiction is that readers and writers because it's a derivative it's based on something else you just get to assume that everyone knows exactly what's going on and you don't have to fill in the in-between bits you don't have to fill in the gaps because the reader can do that themselves because they're familiar with the source material so i feel like if you're used to writing like big time skips and you just sort of like say well just assume that the characters grew closer because it's fan fiction and you're meant to assume because you're just here for like the best bits it doesn't work when you try and then translate that into writing a full-fledged novel if you still have that same style of writing because I feel like you have to not lead the reader by the hand exactly because again that can be quite patronizing but you definitely need to flesh out like your characters their motives the plot the story the world a lot more than was actually executed in this book and I feel like maybe it suffers from being I'm imagining this probably started life as a Darkling Alina fanfiction I feel like it just requires a bit more effort on the author's part other than expecting the reader to just go with it because when it's fanfiction you pretty much do just go with it because it's fanfiction but it doesn't translate quite the same into like an actual published work because when it's not a derivative of anything and I understand that this is still kind of derivative in that it intended to be a sort of play on the whole Alina Darkling thing I get that but at the same time it is also its own standalone work like I shouldn't have to say to you oh yeah go and read the Grisha trilogy and then read this because then you'll get it it's like you shouldn't have to do that and they in fact don't relate because it's different characters and they're set in a different world and even though it's playing on like the same kind of dynamics I feel like they were explored better in the Grisha trilogy and that's saying something because I didn't really like the Grisha trilogy very much like the best thing about the Grisha trilogy um, was the world building and there was almost like no world building in this one besides like the stuff about the gods and the fact that there's like two countries at war and that was like it it really did actually kind of feel a bit like um, to Vinter in Dragon Age where you have like a high society of like blood mages specifically who just don't care about their like the religion of the the other country because it's kind of like yes yeah, screw, screw your thing um, we don't believe in all that we believe in specifically just like doing a whole lot of blood magic and honestly just the more blood magic you do the higher in society you will rise and it's kind of the same thing it's kind of the same dynamic as a lot of things that Emily A. Duncan has explicitly said that she likes and that inspired her writing and I can really really see it and not always in a good way because I, I feel like it's okay to be inspired by things but if you just pluck one thing from here one thing from here one thing from here and shove them all together you haven't really created something new you've just sort of created like a Frankenstein amalgamation of several things that you're a fan of and it doesn't always translate into the best work case and point again I feel like I'm being really harsh because as I say I didn't hate this book um, I feel like if you hate a book you can just sort of like say what's bad with it and move on but the thing is this book has potential it did have potential and I think it still might have potential if it can just get past this weird awkward teething phase of like half trying to be fan fiction half trying to like be its own thing and it's just I wish it would just let go of the weird shippery stuff and like all like the little I don't know like things that remind me of a lot of video games that I like and it would just be its own thing and I think if it did that and I think if the next book was like maybe twice as long as this and just actually explored more about like the world and the characters and maybe if Nadia got a personality this book could be something good um and I, I think it's really up to again the author to I suppose take this as a learning experience because obviously like she's had a great reception to her first book like it was hyped beyond belief um, especially for like a debut novel where again like I guess the only other thing you w might know her for was if you had followed her online I had never heard of her before this um, I'm kind of surprised because like I thought maybe I would have known of her if she'd been in like the Dragon Age fanfiction or like the Skyrim fanfiction because that's where I hang out um, but we I guess never cross paths um, and I suppose if we had I don't know um, maybe I would be more familiar with her work and because I'm not this just seems I don't know I don't know how much she's written I don't know how like 
comfortable she is as an author like because again a debut novel could mean oh yeah I started writing like last year or it could mean I've been writing for 20 years and only just now published like you have no idea so I think there definitely is room for her to improve and this has obviously been like a really good breakout for her and I feel like if she could really just take it and run with it and make it something better and really just like work on improving the good things that she does have I feel like this could get better as the series goes on. Like sometimes there are just series where the first book in a series is kind of meh and this book is kind of meh. So like the next book for all I know could be so much better and that's why I'm kind of holding out hope and I will hopefully uh, read that book and who knows maybe I'll love book two. Maybe book two will be great and will address all the issues that I had with this book and maybe we'll all have a great time. So I'm totally open to that idea and I would like to be supportive of new authors but like at the same time I'm gonna give my opinion and I realize that most of my review has sounded quite negative but it's just because all the things that I liked about this book were just kind of like the basic three star things like if there'd been like loads of I don't know anachronistic errors or like loads of like spelling mistakes or something or if it had just gone like off the walls stupid then the rating would have gone lower but um, I definitely can't really rate this anything higher than a three stars and part of me wonders if like <laughs> Maybe I'm just being generous because it reminds me so much of like other works that I'm a fan of even though it doesn't really have any of the merits of those works that I like actually like about those other works so maybe I am a little bit biased. Maybe I would have rated this book lower if I hadn't read something like I don't know uh, the Grisha trilogy or um, Dragon Age or Skyrim or whatever um, but I guess I'll never know. <laughs> I only really know my own experience and this was my experience with this book so I didn't hate it. I, I liked it enough that I'm willing to continue on with the series and if I hate book two then I'll just stop reading it because maybe it's not worth my time but I'm holding out hope that maybe it will be. So with that said I feel like it's time for me to stop ranting. I was very disappointed by Wicked Saints. I didn't hate it and I get that this is Emily A. Duncan's first book and I know it has been more or less openly said that it was like kind of meant to be like an homage to like a, a Darkling Alina type ship so like I understand that's intended and like it is what it is but also like even in the original like Darkling Alina wasn't even that good so like <laughs> why? Yeah I feel like this could have honestly been a good book if it didn't kind of like kind of feel a bit first drafty like it kind of falls into that whole of fan fiction of the plot is very much secondary to the romance and in fact I feel like a lot of things just happen in the plot to further like some of the faux angst and like the drive behind the romance like where the shipping is just very much obviously the main point of the book and everything else like the plot and whatnot all just sort of like gravitates around the romance at the center of the novel which I don't know if you're trying to write like a dark gothic bloody whatever just don't put the romance at the middle like you can have a romance just I don't know it it just don't make it the only thing <laughs> because again the romance was very insta loving it was very just like I don't know I don't even know like why they liked each other she's just kind of plain and pasty he's also just kind of plain and pasty he's always like picking at his nails has long hair maybe she just like really has a fetish for being like you know like lifted up by the chin maybe that's Nadja's thing he wasn't even that charismatic he didn't really do anything he just he just kind of sat around writing in his spell book and like bleeding everything just bleeding all over the carpet just bleeding everywhere just why would you want to be in a relationship with this guy like everything is going to be red you're going to have to have a red carpet and a red couch and red everything otherwise you're going to have blood to clean up like it's not attractive as i said i rated this three stars so i didn't hate it like i can still be entertained by a book even if i feel like it doesn't actually have like that much merit or like originality and it's it was really short so for like the two days that it took me to read this like in bed and like on the bus like I was entertained enough like I can at least say that I wasn't bored and like the book the thing is the book is much prettier than the story within like the, the physical object I have is worth more to me than the actual prose inside which is unfortunate but like at least it's not an ugly book as well and I don't dislike Emily Duncan's style of writing, I just feel like this has quite a way to go before I feel like it's honed into something that I would consider to be a good book. I have said already that I'm going to pick up the next book in the series when it comes out uh, and I'm going to give that a shot. Since like 
A writer can definitely improve from one book to the next, especially because this is a debut. And hopefully, like, the very setup y kind of nature of this book will, like, not carry forward into the next one. And also, like, the whole insta love romance thing will not be a thing in the next book because, like, I think we've already dealt with that. So, like, hopefully, the issues I had with the first book won't appear in the second book. Hopefully. <laughs> I'm just hoping that it would transition into something a bit more well-founded and developed. Obviously this is all wishful thinking at this point but I am willing to give this series another go. Ideally I would enjoy every book that I picked up so like I don't want to dislike this series, I would like to like this series because um, that would be the best result. Um, but yeah I just don't think the execution is there yet, at least just for my tastes. So uh, yeah, that was my like little review slash discussion of what I thought about Wicked Saints. Um, again, I don't really want to talk too much about things like the world building and whatnot because I just feel like it's kind of cut and paste. It's like more or less Grisha, but also it's just Slavic stuff and it's not really lifted that much above what I would expect of just a basic ass fantasy based on Slavic culture. So I haven't really touched on stuff like that and I don't really feel the need to. Um, mainly my kind of gripes were just about like the poor plot, like the paper thin plot line and the fact that we all just do what Malachi says. So that's about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so hopefully um, you found this at least a little bit interesting. Um, let me know what you thought of Wicked Saints if you have read it. Obviously if you enjoyed this book then like great for you um, and if you hated this book then I'm sorry and like I kind of feel your pain. Um, <laughs> But yeah, let me know what you thought overall, if you read this book, if you have any of the same opinions as me, or if you like, maybe you feel completely different, like, feel free to shout at me in the comments below if you don't agree, um, because maybe we could have a discussion about that. Hopefully a nice one. Um, I don't think anything that anyone can say would make me enjoy this book more than I, like, already did. Like, I'm not gonna rate it any higher. <laughs> I've been generous with the three stars already. So yeah, uh, that was like my little my little rant, like my little, it's not really a rant, but it is kind of like a, a casual review, let's call it, like a casual, sort of all over the place, mainly not very structured review of Wicked Saints by Emily A. Duncan. So um, with that said, I'm going to end this video now. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and if you did, hopefully you will maybe come back and watch another video of mine in the future. But until then, peace out, booktube.